And we're going to be digging into some stuff that is weighty and significant. The Christian faith is the ultimate philosophical uh, mind bender. Not that it is overly complicated, but that there is mystery here. And it's mystery that touches close to the personal things of our lives. So let me just read this little bit of scripture to us, and we're going to see the magnitude of it. This is the big picture as to why we even have breath in our bodies. This is what the Apostle says. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about somebody who's very specific. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does he do? He has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Do you know the weight of that? That is monumental. It puts everything else in its place. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. What does that mean? It means that every single one of your choices that you think are really significant pale into insignificance compared to the fact that there is a personal God who is actively choosing things. We're so self-centered and we so think that we're the center of the universe. No, there is a God who actively chooses. Can you think of anything more important than to know and to live out of than knowing what the creator chooses? You can't get in the way of that. And what does he choose? He chooses us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, oh, I can't wait to tell you about that in a minute. In love, he predestines us to be adopted as his sons through through Jesus Christ in accordance with his good pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. We're on holy ground today, people. We're going to go into the very heart of God, what he's doing, and how that changes everything. We're going to need help, aren't we? Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, we praise you that as we look into these amazing realities, only heard here in the Bible, we realise that we are walking on holy ground, and we realise that personal things will happen amongst us. Please, would you help us to see and know something of these great mysteries? that we may live in accordance and that we may praise you. Help speaker and hearer alike come near to us. By your spirit, call us, draw us, reveal to us and conform us. Or do good things amongst us. We beg in the name of the one whose name is above every name, Jesus Christ himself. Amen. You guys sing a lot. That was the comment of a mate of mine. When he'd experienced coming along to church, it was a bit odd, a bit strange to him. It's like, you guys sing a lot, don't you? It's a bit weird. It's a bit desperate, he said. And you sort of know where he's coming from. He was totally wrong, by the way. But I did think about that for a while. Uh, The other night, I had the opportunity, paid for by somebody else, to go and listen to one of the world's foremost intellectual academics by the name of Jordan Peterson, he's all over YouTube, he's a bit of a phenomenon, some of you guys have heard of him, some of you guys have not heard of him, but what struck me was the number of people who turned up to listen to the words of wisdom that this guy would pass out on almost any topic out there. And it was a very strange format, we're over in the Manchester Apollo, Uh, a couple of thousand had turned out the night before, a couple of thousand turned out on our night, there's people from every conceivable lifestyle, there were people dressed in suits, there were uh, young studenty types, there were middle-aged people there, there were couples, there were people from different ethnic backgrounds, and they all sat and hungered for what wisdom would pour forth from this guy's mouth. It was quite a spectacle, I was absolutely fascinated and so glad I could be there, but you know what we didn't do at the end? We didn't sing. He didn't sing. I wondered why that was. You see, people think when they're not familiar with church that the reason we sing, the reason that we praise God, you know why? It's almost pseudo Pentecostal. It's a little bit like this. People view us as turning up, as God botherers at church. We praise so that the blessings will come down. Do you get that? I know we will give this strange narcissistic deity in the sky, this self-important one, if we like in Ephesus the way they used to do it, they turn up and rock up at the temples, 
to give some sort of homage, give some sort of praise, put some sort of money in, do some sort of duty, pray some sort of prayer, in order that the blessings might come down. Do you know that temptation? Now, you won't sing at a Jordan Peterson event because no blessings are likely to come down. You might have some wisdom, but he can't. Or you won't sing at a Jordan Peterson event because he's given wisdom for you to go and do and actuate so that your life may be a little bit better. But you don't sing about that. That's not good news. And the first thing that the Apostle Paul wants to say to this small, vulnerable, hodgepodge bunch of Christians in that huge cosmopolitan of Ephesus is he says, you're different. You're going to sing. You don't praise so the blessings come down. You will praise and glory in the living God because the blessings have already come down. Do you get this? We don't praise so that we are blessed. We praise because we are blessed. Do you get that, people? Now, of course, as you come into church on a Sunday morning, or even as you pick up your Bible day by day, dig into his word, those things sort of go quiet and the volume of them turn down. And that's why this is the most wonderful place to be. It's the most wonderful place to be because we will be reminded and invited to see afresh and live out afresh the blessings that are already ours. Granted by the living God. He doesn't reward us, he blesses us. Did you get that? Now I know you sort of want to be in a world where he does reward, but that's only because you've got an over optimistic opinion of yourself. But what about those moments when you have failed? Anybody not failed this week? When things aren't going the way? Yeah, the idea of getting a reward, oh dear, there's not even a point of chunk trying. No, he doesn't reward. He blesses. We don't praise to get blessed, but because we're blessed, we praise. Because his mercy is more. Now that might be new to some of you today. Can I tell you, you're in for a wonderful treat. It could be something that you have forgotten. I'll tell you whether or not I land this Bible message today. What do you think you'll be doing? What do you think you'll be doing? You? You? Singing? You won't be singing. You'll be singing! Do you get the difference, peeps? Oh, I hope you do. And what an unusual place. The city of Ephesus. There, the tight temple of uh, uh, the goddess Diana or Artemis, depending on which language you use, one of the seven wonders of the world, and they went and they paid their homage in order to get their blessings. And all the people from all the nations, with all the arguments and all the divisions, were there. And to that place, the gospel message of Jesus Christ had come, and it was turning things upside down. It was creating a real tension. Hold on, there is blessing that comes outside from outside that we can receive. And now, six years later, Paul is writing to them and telling them all about it. And he's sitting in a prison. What kind of person praises in a prison? Maybe you feel like you're in a prison today, a prison of your own making or of the circumstances or the unkindness or the situation and circumstances that have fell upon you. Can I tell you that even if you're in a prison today, there is something bigger than your present experience, and that is, or what does he call it? The spiritual blessings in Jesus Christ that have come at you for free. Now, this is hugely important. 38 times in the book of Ephesians, you get the, the, the phrase either in Christ or through Christ or in the beloved. In fact, this, the, the sentence running from verse 3 through to verse 14 is 202 words. I say sentence, we've broken it up, but in the Greek, in the original, the Apostle Paul is like a stumbling kid. And he just pours it all out. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realm. I ought to memorize it, maybe if you want to bless your soul, bless your soul by doing that. But 14 times, it's all about in and through Jesus Christ. Connection with spiritual reality and all of the blessings of the sovereign living God, who isn't asleep, who is present, who owns the world, all of them come through that conduit in and through Jesus Christ. You can have it all. By his good pleasure and will. I was trying to illustrate this. It's sort of like a proprietary thing. You know, it's like, anybody got an iPhone here? Okay, and if you want to work your iPhone, what do you have to do? 
You have to get plugged into it. And has anybody got a USB-C charger that you've tried to charge your iPhone with? What happens when you try and shove that thing in? Don't work, does it? It's proprietary technology. You have to connect to the blessing of an iPhone through the right conduit. And the living God says the conduit, his name is Jesus Christ. If you want ultimate spiritual reality, it comes through him. The one that the living God spoke about all through the Old Testament, my son would come. The one in Psalm 2 who's declared when the nations were running helter-skelter out of control and, uh, and, and in rebellion, the living God declares that I will lift up my son because in him people will find hope, blessing and redemption. He goes on in Psalm 2 to say, kiss the son, come to him. It all comes and gets filtered through him. So 14 times in this sentence, it's all in him. I had an in him experience not so long ago, but it wasn't in Jesus Christ. Can I tell you who it was? It was in Paisley. And you're like, what? Now, one of our church members, her maiden name is Paisley, and her grandfather was a prominent uh, manager of Liverpool, Bob Paisley. And the result of that was, was that in Paisley, there are season tickets. And I remember the first day that I was in Paisley, and it was with Matty, because he was in Paisley too. And he got these ticket things with a picture on, which we sort of covered up. And he gave you access to the mighty spiritual blessing that is Anfield. And I remember all these other plebs. And they're walking up having paid however much, I don't know how much they paid, 60, 80, 150 to get into the normal seats. But we weren't going to the normal seats. We were going to the director's lounge, baby. <laughs> and in there, well, we walked in, and I was like shattered, I was sort of sheltering in the shadow of Matty going, this isn't quite right, I shouldn't have access to this place. And Matty just bowled the grass, because well, that's Matty, isn't it? And just like flicks his in Paisley. It's the same Paisley on it, but it was achieved through the merits of Paisley. And we walked in, and the security guard took one look down at us and thought, yeah, all right, that doesn't make no sense to me, but we got in. And then once we found our seats uh, during the, the intermission in the half term, we could uh, half term, oh, half term <laughs> even, we managed to get to go into the director's lounge and there's all these sorts of B, C, D grade celebrities who were in there. And I'm like, something they're going flipping it. They played a lot to get in here. Stan Boardman was in there. There were some past players. They probably got in on their own merit, merit, but most of the others, you could tell the ones who paid an awful lot to get in there because they were dressed the best. Me and Matty were the worst dressed in there. But did it matter? Because we were in Paisley. We were in on the basis of his worth. He opened the door for us. Now can I tell you, might not, you might not believe it, but there is one who is greater than Paisley. Isn't that right, Rach? Amen. And his name is Jesus Christ. And at his name, access to every spiritual blessing that the living God wants to pour out on needy lost souls is made available. Now I love the idea of being in KC because that's what my pride says. But ask my wife whether that will get me in. The answer is no. And so Paul in his prison is saying, I know my past, I know what I've done, I know where I was, I knew how I shook my hand, uh, fist at the thought of ever bowing the knee to the living God. I wanted to design and control my own life and make of my own life what I will, much like all the Ephesians who were trying to uh, muddle on through with their own wisdom and in defiance of the living God. Then Jesus Christ came, granting blessings on the basis of his own character. That is what it means to be a Christian. You're in Jesus Christ. But look how it goes with this. He talks about the power and the certainty of it. And if ever you've doubted and feared that you can fall out of Jesus Christ, or it's to do with the reward that you get for being the right kind of person, look at what he says in the next verse. He says, for, this is all wrapped up in the praising of the spiritual, uh, of God who just bestows spiritual blessings on people. For, because he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless, in his sight. Oh yes, the living God makes a choice. He doesn't have to do it. 
But he personally chooses to draw people into himself for his own glory. Now, I wonder whether you've ever had that horrible feeling of not being picked. We're constantly worried about missing out. We make shows and watch movies about the person who gets picked, and it's almost always on the basis of the merit that they bring to it. So people get checked out, and if they're good enough, they get chosen. But what if they're not? One of my favourite shows that does that and reveals that, anybody here watch The Voice? What happens on The Voice? They're sitting, not booking, and then somebody behind, what they start to do? Sing, and the cameras focus in on the judges, the bestowers of blessing. And what have they got right in front of them? A big button. And what happens when they hit the button? Turns the chair around. And I'm told, is it in the British one as well as on the American one? It says, I want you. And what do we want? What we do, we're watching go, will these bestowers of blessing think that they are good enough to get the button pressed and the big declaration, I want you? Which of us in this room haven't wondered whether if we had an encounter with the living God, whether he would push the button and say, I want you? But then we read the grounds of his wanting. Look at this. Look what it says. For he chose us in him when we started to sing really well. Is that what it says? What's it say? In other words, before there was even a cosmos, if you're a believer, you were in his thoughts. And it wasn't because you had sung well. It wasn't because he saw that your best potential. It wasn't because <coughs> you were a, a victor in life. He saw your need. He saw you at your worst. And he says, I'm going to go get him. I am going to choose to put my love on that mess. Now, for anybody here, who's ever felt pretty rotten and knows what it means to be passed over. There is a God who, before you did anything, he knows what good and bad you will do next week or in 2027. All the things that you wish you hadn't failed in, he's totally aware of. And he chooses to set his luck upon you before the beginning of the cosmos. What does this mean? Paul is saying to the Ephesians who have turned and heard the call of Jesus and trusted in him, he says, God's been thinking about you for a long, long time. He really has. And I wonder whether you will let that sink in. It basically means that if spiritually we're on the voice, and you've got how many judges, is it? Four judges. And the buzzer is there, and the living God is one of them. Before you start to sing, he hits that buzzer. I want you. You and all your mess. You and all your brokenness. I want you. And what, why does he do it? He does it in love. Can I tell you he's been thinking about you for an awful long time? And that's why Paul's singing. It speaks to a level of security and hope that will quiet our fears in our failure. It will humble us deeply. Because I love the idea of I get chosen because I sing the best. Good luck with that for you, Nathan. No. This is the Christian hope that he loves on us. So why does he do this? What is it? Is it because we've got potential? Is it because we're going to be good in his team? Or we look back through the Bible story and we see that he picks a guy called Abraham who worshipped the moon and was spiritually totally messed up. And he says, I'm going to take you and do something good with you. And Abraham's like, why? And no answer comes back. And then by the time we get to the point where Abraham's children have grown into a big nation, he speaks to them because they attempted to get big, too big for their hoof. And he says to them this, and I'll read it to you from... Um, 
Deuteronomy chapter 7, if you do like Bible noting, this is such an important bit of the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 7. And this is what it says. The Lord did not set his affection on you or choose you because you were more numerous than any other peoples. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept his oath. Did you hear that? Why does the Lord set his love upon people? Well, it's not something in them. It's because of something in him. He loves you because he loves you. Does that bring you relief? I was just, when I was studying this yesterday, I'm trying to fig- figure out how to do this. I, um, I was sitting at a uh, at table in our dining room and my eyes lifted up to the bookshelf, whereupon was a picture of four of my daughters. Now, when did my relationship start with my daughters? Well, it depends who you're talking to. If you're talking to one of my daughters, what age were they? When did my relationship with them start? Well, if you talk to them, when did they have a sense of that relationship? About four? Maybe. Maybe when they're one? But if you talk to me, when did my relationship start with my daughters? And at that point, actually, it wasn't straight away, because we hadn't planned Bethany. (laughs) (laughs) And for about the first eight months, I was like, nope. (laughs) Nope. Now, I've got a relationship with her, but it wasn't a good one. Nope. I remember remember when she was born. I remember being in the delivery room. She was an absolute nightmare pregnancy. But there was certain concern she'd had. If you ever wonder why she's a bit weird, it's because she had that bon tooth thing, sucker on her head to pour out. <laughs> her head all looked all weird and funny. And Jane had been battling for 36 hours or 38 hours, whatever it was. And I remember as she came out, um, we're there in the delivery suite, and Jane's over there, absolutely exhausted. And then they whisk Bethany off and put her over there, and I'm standing right in the middle. And I don't know which to go. Which way do you think I went? I felt this tear coming down my eye, uh, down my down my cheek, out my eye, and I'm just pointing in the direction of Bethany. Why? She's got a cone-shaped head. (laughs) (laughs) Why? And all of that came rushing back to me as I saw that photo in front of me. I looked, and it's only got four little girls on there, and they're absolute scumbags. (laughs) <laughs> and I know each of them better than they know themselves I know the things they've done I know their attitudes I know what brings out the worst of them but I also know all the beautiful things about them and I sat there and it happened again I felt a tear coming down my cheek they're mine I shouldn't and I should I'd love them you see that verse there? In love. And if a callous, cold-hearted person like me can just love because he loves. Somebody who knows nothing about, uh, about passion and love compared with the living God. The living God has been thinking about me. Me! I am beloved before the world began. He saw all the ugly about me. And he came for me in the person of his son. He wanted to adopt me into his family. In fact, he predestined to draw me into his family when I knew nothing about him and was quite happy to go my very own way. It was done according to the pleasure of his will. In other words, it's not stingy and begrudging. It's not because it was like, oh God, I suppose I'm supposed to help people out. There was a warmth and an intensity when there was nothing hanging over him to make him do it because naturally I would have gone my own way and ran away from the living God all my life and I have done it clapping my hands and celebrating my own self-worth. When he owed me nothing, his son came into the world to save me. 
And so when it comes to my eternal destiny and me knowing this blessing, whose choice is more important, mine or his? Maybe you've had this experience, you, you, you know what this is like. It's a bit confusing for us because if we're somebody here who knows Jesus Christ, we, re, we can remember a few of the steps and it all feels centred on us. We heard the good news of who Jesus was and we fought against it because we're like, I'm not a sinner, I'm not in need of grace, I'm one of the good people. Or, I ain't got time for this, he's really not that important, he's not really Lord, I'm Lord in my own life. And we're cracking out, we're doing our own thing and then his word hangs heavy upon us as if it... As if it's calling to us, as if it's drawing us. And we begin to feel unsettled and think, maybe God is God, and I'm not. And maybe if his son really is who he says he is and can do the things he says he can do, maybe I need to take a leap of faith and trust in Jesus. Maybe I need to choose him. And so that's salvation from our angle. And for many of us in this room, we've had that experience. We have been on that story uh, journey. It's part of our story. But it feels like, who's the operative one in the midst of this? It feels like it's us. Until we've been there for a little while. And as we look back, we're like, what the heck? Maybe... I even got those desires in my own heart because he had already chosen me. I think Spurgeon put it well when he put it this way. He was another Baptist pastor in the previous century, well, the 1800s, and he said this, I have no question that God chose me because I'm quite sure that if God had not chosen me, I should never have chosen him. And I'm sure he chose me before I was born or else he would never have chosen me afterwards and he must have elected me for reasons unknown to me for I never could find any reason in myself why he should have looked upon me with special love so I feel like I am forced to accept this doctrine that God chooses people do you get that and maybe you feel that yourself the Lord Jesus spoke about this. He says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. We live that out, don't we? Because we pray for people. There are precious people in our family or in our neighbourhood or in our workplace. And we pray, Lord, bring them to you. Because inside of us, there is a sense that it's impossible for a prideful human being to turn and receive these blessings of their own volition. Do we choose? Yes, but it's because he has first chosen us. So what can I say in my own life? It's not I found God, but that he found me. When I was running away, he ran after me and offered me this hope. And I can know that I'm chosen because when he did that, I chose him. So listen, maybe you're not sure as you're listening here, am I chosen? Well, if you hear the invite to come to Jesus, and it warms your heart and you know you've got to choose him, I'll tell you it's because he first chose you. Somebody once wrote this, the whosoever wills, as in whosoever will may come, the whosoever wills are the elect and the whosoever won't are the non-elect. So what do you do? You choose him. You grab hold of him. If God is saying yes to you and inviting and you're hearing that, then you say yes to him. I believe in Jesus. I choose you. I want you, Lord. And in that moment, you know that you're chosen. That's the way it works. Is there mystery here? Of course there is. Does it defy and antagonise our self-will and like that sense that we really can choose whatever we want? Of course it does. It insults us because we're not actually as big as we like to think we are. The big actor in salvation is not us and our wisdom. Otherwise, you lot would have to sit here and say, I'm cleverer than everybody else in speak. I'm more morally pure than everybody else in speak. No, you're not. You're chosen. Not because of a choice, but because God loves. And he loves to put his love on the most unlikely. You know the angels step by and stand by and they're watching how the Lord is calling to people. He calls, sends out his gospel call to everybody. 
And they're looking on and going, oh dear, he's doing this thing again. Because people who've got all the reasons in the world why they would never come and trust and love on Jesus are doing it. And the angels know that that's because God is gracious. Because God is loving. It was put like this, uh, and I liked it. And when you make a battle with this, and you're trying to figure out your way through who chooses and what happens, and who's is it chicken and egg thing or something like this. And prominent theologian A. A. Hodge says this: Does God know the day that you'll die? Yep. Has He appointed that day? Yep. Can you do anything to change that day? Nope. Then why do you eat? Answer, you eat to live. What happens if you don't eat? You die. Then if you don't eat and die, hmm, then would that be the day that God had appointed for you to die? Anybody's brain hurting? Then he follows up and says this. Quit asking stupid questions and just eat! Eating is the preordained way that God has appointed you to live. The preordained way that God has appointed you to live spiritually is to come to Jesus Christ when you hear his name. Just do it and eat. Just come to him. Because God is calling a family to himself of people who will live under him. They're called for the purpose of being blameless and holy because he knows we're not. Jesus Christ came, who was blameless, who was holy, and he took on your blame and guilt. He took on your unholiness and he carried the price for it. He went to a cross as one who was blamed and unholy and suffered under it, taking the punishment for it so that we could be free. <coughs> and he is working out this new identity in us by his grace. That's just what he does because he loves to do it. So let me just finish by bringing four quick implications to you as to what this will mean for us. Number one, it means we can have total assurance. Now you may wrestle with this idea of God's choosing and his electing. But Paul's saying it here, not so that you will wrestle with it, but so that you will rest in it. Not so you will debate it, but so that you will celebrate it. Because God is in the driving seat. And he loves to bring salvation to the most unlikely. It means that if we are in him and him before the beginning of the before the beginning of the cosmos, he had set his love on people, not on the basis of their performance. It means that on your worst day, you are still just a son. On your best day, you are still just as safe. There will be days when I let go of God, but it means that he will not let go of me. Please can I get an amen? And that is why I love to celebrate this bit of the Bible, because I know what I'm like. If you knew the vain and self-centered pridefulness that sits in this human heart, my vain and empty emotions, my pretensions to importance, my cruel thoughts towards others, I need a God who runs after me. And this is that God. He will not let me go. It means when we face times of suffering and we're confused as to what it might mean and who God is and whether he is good, in those moments you have to realise that that period and season of suffering and confusion is wrapped around by a God who says, before the world began, I pledge myself to you and I'm not going to let you go. So that difficult period is wrapped up in that certain assurance. So total assurance is number one. Next one is radical humility. You see, religion, the religion of the Ephesians was one of performance. So if you got blessed, it was because you had done something to deserve it. In so many other domains of life, in all of the other religions, all of them in the world, it is a religion of performance. 
you bring something, you say a prayer, you do the homage, you sing the song, you go to the place, you perform morally, and then you can have confidence. And therefore, most religions are incredibly proud, and they find it easy to look down on people. But if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not in because you brought anything to the deal. Your salvation is not something you have achieved, it is something you have received as a gift because he chose you, and he set his love upon you. Which means you are freed up to be honest about yourself. That though you are not as bad as you could be, you're not the, you're not the person you could be, should be, or ought to be. It means that our community of people will be deeply honest about what is wrong with us and deeply humbled by that and praising. We will be the most humble because what we've got has been given to us freely. We won't pretend even when the way that we relate to one another. We won't be playing those games of trying to pretend we're something we're not. We can be honest because we're secure. Thirdly, there's a hope of change. He has intended and saved us so that we will be holy and blameless. If you know Jesus, you are not the person you were and you are not the person who you yet will be. And sometimes I look at myself and wish that I could change more. And I look at my potential to change and it's pretty puny. But with this God, I know that because Jesus has won, there is a day when Steve Casey will be less high maintenance than he is today. Can I get an amen? There's a day when Matty will be tolerable. There is a day when Kaylee won't be narky. There is a day when Weston will be all the things that he's not right now. Why? Because that is why he's called you into his family. The living God is not a force, he is a father. And he is parenting us to an end goal. You can have the hope of change. And lastly, it means we will sing people. We will sing, as these verses say, to the praise of his glory. We sing not to get blessing, but because we are blessed. We sing to one another and we sing to the world. We sing with optimism because if he is making these choices, if he is delivering salvation, then nobody is beyond the reach of Jesus. So we will sing and tell this gospel story knowing that as we tell of who Jesus is, many people will reject, but the most unlikely will receive. We sing it to people. We sing it to ourselves and we sing it to the world to the praise of his glorious grace. So let me ask you this. Do you want to sing more now than when we started? Well, that's up to you. We're going to sing a song that is all about the praising the glorious grace. Many of us have sung it in other places. I still don't, we can't quite nail down whether we've Thank sung it have. here before. Kaylee, who has a good memory yeah. for these things, says we have. But because the musicians were less sure and confident, we're going to sing it off 